as you know, rotation has been introduced. This is the subject you've been hearing over and over. In substance, what shall it? What does it say? That you shall rotation applies to all companies except small companies and one person companies. It says listed companies and such other companies as may be prescribed. The minister went overboard and prescribed all companies to the all companies. And it says you, if you are a sole proprietor, you cannot be an auditor for more than five years. If you are a firm, you cannot be an auditor for more than ten years. And for this purpose, count will be retrospective. Provisions relating to directors, the count is prospective. They said you, if the clock is reset to zero. But provisions relating to auditors, it is retrospective. The only relief is they have given three years relief. You should comply within three years. That means even if you have completed ten years, you can continue for three more years. But within the three years, they have to change. So effectively it means, if you have completed 10 years, you can serve another 3 years. If you have completed 9 years, you can serve another 3 years only. If you have completed 8 years, you can serve 3 years. If you have completed 7 years, you can serve 3 years. You can't exceed 10. If you have completed 6 years, you can serve 4 more years. Like that it goes on. If you are a firm. If you are an individual, it is 5 years. That's exactly what this says. And there are limits of course. Now this is the whole, then it also, there are, if you go to the rules, <coughs> the incoming auditor should not have any partner in common with the outgoing auditor. Further it says if the incoming auditor recruits a person who is in charge of the audit firm of the earlier auditor, this incoming auditor is disqualified. So they have tried to plug some manner of getting around it, but the reality is that there is rotation. We are not on to debating whether rotation is good or bad. Rotation is coming up in many parts of the world. But the challenge of rotation is only you need to look at rotation in the context of scope of services and in the context of the definition of relative, etc. Meaning, if you are going to rotate out of one company and you are expecting the audit of another company, you should not have rendered services to that company to disqualify you from so that poses its own challenge. And you or your relatives should not have shares in that company, you should not have loans to that company, you should have or not have a business relationship. All I'm saying is when you extend this across, you will have a problem. Okay, this is the common part. So they have now restricted the rotation to listed companies, unlisted companies, paid up capital of 10 crores or more private companies of 20 crores or more and anyone which has public borrowings greater than 50 crore. So, well, still it's a very large number of companies where rotation impacted. This is the only concession which they made very recently in Rubens. This is, then they are saying firms covered by the same network, trademark, brand, etc. common control. So, there are some rules that I said, the person who is in charge of an audit firm also certifies and retires from the set firm and joins another firm, that firm is disqualified to them. Those would be extreme cases in which it can happen. But it also provides that appointment shall be for five years. Henceforth, an auditor is appointed. You will appoint him for five years. You can't him. And at every agent, there is a confirmation. What it means, God knows. What happens if shareholders don't confirm? Does it amount to removal? Removal requires permission. You can't remove an auditor. That the law is not clear. But the, what the law is clear on is you shall appoint for five years. After this transition period is over, any company where you are appointed, you will be appointed for five years. And then thereafter, nobody can Then it says where it's a listed company, where there is an audit committee, the audit committee shall follow a certain process. They should look at the qualifications of the auditor, experience. They may call for such other information. They will uh, also have regard to which says any order or pending proceeding relating to the professional matters of conduct. What is pending proceeding? How long? Or any order? How long ago? If you have, if there is some institute order which is there ten years ago, you still require to disclose. That is not clear. There is no time period. 
what is pending procedure? Is it only disciplinary cases which are not pending? And it says ICI or any competent authority or any court, this is, it can become uh, you know, vicious as far as this is going. And they have laid down a process about audit committee recommending, board accepting that recommendation, board can reject that recommendation. That is the process which is there. I think in reality it may not happen that a board will reject what is. I won't spend time on that because we need to spend time on the other provisions. Not on the first auditor, casual vacancy not required, I think that is not removal. You can remove an auditor only if the previous approval of the central fund. Otherwise, it is a point of five years. So there is a process of removal which needs to be followed, which is not an easy process. Uh, let's look at eligibility. Okay. For the first time, LLPs can be appointed. You can have an LLP now. If you have an LLP in professional practice, you can have more than 100 partners. There is no limit in fact only on the number of partners. As you know, the suit is all now permitted non-CAs to be found. So long as they do not exceed 50% of the majority are CAs. But those who are non-CAs cannot sign financial statements under the company. So LLP can be appointed as an auditor and where a firm including LLP is appointed, only partners who are chartered accountants shall be authorized to act and sign on the Only they can be authorized. That's the problem. Look at the disqualification. Just ask yourself, you need to have documentation to prove your compliance. How do you do that? Holding of security. An auditor himself, his relative or partner hold any security or interest in a company, its subsidiary company, its holding company, or associate company or subsidiary of such holding. There you know. That means every company I you have audit, you, your partners, your relatives should confirm in a way, you should have some documentation to prove that they are not holding any securities in all those companies. So even assuming you write to your brother or your father or whoever it is, you have to first give a list of the companies and say, these companies are you holding any securities. Any time. So that means even though at the point of time of appointment of auditor nobody is holding, you are appointed for five years. In those five years, nobody should hold. How do you get that information and keep track? Let's say you audit 100 companies. Will you share your list of 100 with all your relatives and say, please don't buy anything in any of these? Huh? They may buy because you are disqualified. If two brothers fight, and they want to destroy the army, you go and buy shares. <laughs> you show the story. You see, you have got it. You have got it. Fine, then what happens? You disqualify. Add your vacancy automatically. They will ask the price of the audit. Pardon? They will ask the share in the audit. No, no, it can happen even if two partners fight. All the other partner has to do is go and buy our shares <laughs> of a company of which we have the audit. Fine, you are taking the firmness. <laughs> The, there has to be some uh, semblance in this. And that's why I said this is not nothing to do with it's small, it impacts everybody. How, first of all, can you, if I ask you, are you independent? For you to say yes, you should have followed some process of finding out. Okay. Honestly, I don't know how I will do it. I can only go on a base of negative uh, sure sort of Nothing has come to my attention. Therefore, I believe I am independent. Right? Nobody, I have, I have, my look, at least nothing has come to my attention that my brother or sister are holding any shares. Or they have given indebtedness guarantee or any security. Thousands of people take loans from companies, banks, etc. We order. Then that person who is taking loan, they will say, are you guarantee for my signature layoff? So he will come to somebody who is maybe related to you would have signed as guarantor. How do you, you are disqualified. You will stop. If this, Surfaces. Only thing is that the limit is here for 1 lakh <laughs> and of course it has been raised to 5 lakh so that's a different uh, the guarantee is 1 lakh. Indebtedness is 5 lakhs but that is the, and this is the list of relatives I have shown you this list. Uh, it's a huge list and all members of any are divided family. Whole list. Then there you also disqualified. You directly or indirectly have a business relationship. 
They have now come up with some clarifications to business relationship. The way the law was worded, it meant that if I was an auditor of Jet Airways, who Jet Airways have this problem. Why? If I am an auditor of, say, Oberoi, I stay in the Oberoi Hotel and this problem. This was his business relation. But thankfully, now they have said commercial transactions which are in the ordinary course of business, and so long as it is at arm's length, they are exempt. But this again extends to companies such as we holding associate air, everything they pay. So or, there is another dimension to this. You may not buy a share. Your brother may not buy a share. The company goes and acquires another, invests in another company and becomes an associate, in which your brother may have had some share. Then you are disqualified as an order for the development. You have no control over what the company does to it buys. Okay, Shambhani may go and buy this company, Reliance may buy so many companies. And you are holding a share or your brother is holding some shares. The day it becomes an associate of that, you are responsible. And this illustration. So similarly, relatives have to act. If a relative is a director or an employment or director key manager, again, my only concern is dependence. But here it may be somewhat easier to monitor. Limits I spoke about 20. And you are disqualified if you are convicted of a fraud, and I hope it doesn't apply to anybody. But then 10 years are not over from your date of conviction. And then, we come to section 144, which is on scope of services. That is, if you are providing any services which are covered by section 144, you are not eligible to be appointed as an auditor. Let's look at what that 144 is. There is an issue with 144. Okay. Powers, the power now is extends to subsidiary also, only so far as consolidation. You can access the books of the subsidiary only so far as it relates to consolidation. I will come to that uh, scope of services, it is a separate section of this. Let us look at reporting, what is needed. I told you reporting has been enhanced. All the first ones, all these are there already, there is nothing new in this. You are already looking at these sections. Here you are now required to comply with accounting and auditing standards, fine you are always expected to, so I am not worried about that. Then, they have added this word whether he has sought and obtained all information and Earlier you had to say that we have obtained all information and Now whether you have sought and obtained all. So the onus is on you to determine what information you want. Okay, even that is not much. The rest are all new. Uh, nothing new in time. But look at this. Back second, second item. Observations or comments of the auditor on financial transactions or matters which have an adverse effect on the functioning of the company. Just pause and read this and ask yourself, comments on, or, on financial transactions or matters which have an adverse effect on the functioning of the company, you are right. What does it mean? Is there, if there is a huge tax demand, do I write? If it is a matter which has an adverse effect on the functioning of the company, if it is held against the company, if there is a difference, issue of license, whether it's mining license or telecom, do I write in the auditor's report? There is a huge dispute with the union, it is a matter which can, it's a trans, it could be the matter which has an adverse effect on the function of the company. Financial transactions, we are not talking of compliance with the company standards. We are asked to report on matters which can have an adverse effect. Very big statement. And this is what follows. What does this exactly mean? It's a very big step. This is new. <coughs> the rest is, and then they have added this, whether the company has adequate financial control systems in place and the operating effectiveness of the company applies to public and private companies also. We told them that the director's obligation is only for listed companies. But you have extended the auditor's reporting obligation to all companies. How they are responsible for introducing it. <coughs> so you should make the auditor report only when they are responsible. If private companies' directors are not required to say they are responsible. Why are you making the auditor report? You have to wait and see as to when this 
Then they, they have added three items through the rules. The auditor shall disclose whether, uh, sorry, disclose the impact of pending litigations. This is already required to be disclosed as funding impact. Why in the audit report you have to disclose impact of pending litigations? What are you going to say? That if they lose, this is the financial impact. If they win, this is the credit. How do you I feel we should be asked to report on the accuracy of what's reported in the financial statement. We should not be used as news readers and saying here is the news which is coming from there. Why? Then the second one, whether the company has made provision under any law or accounting standard for material or for sale losses on long term contracts to do there is an obligation in any case. Otherwise, accounts do not show to them. Why do we have to state that they have made provision or not made provision? And delayed transferring amounts required to be transferred to investor education protection. In addition, what is required by Garo may get replaced also, may get added. It is currently under the new law, only three items are there, and they will add many more. Okay. For the year ended March 14, the old Garo is none of these are But this is going forward for the financial year 14. Then the killer, section 143.12. Section 143.12 says, if in the course of an audit, you have reason to believe that an offense, in, offense involving fraud is being or has been committed, is being committed, you have to report to center. It has not yet happened. You believe it, there is going to be a fraud. They are going to come in, they are doing something. You have to report to Central. They may not get. Then, if you look at the definition of fraud under Section 447, I don't know whether it is here. Uh, the form. Okay. If you see Section 447 and the definition of fraud, it is so wide. It says whether there is monetary loss or gain, abuse of power, all that is fraud. How will you do it? Then when representations are made, the ministry incorporated material. He said there is no material fraud. I don't have to report a fraud. In financial services company, there will be credit card fraud, there will be loan fraud, false documentation, everything is fraud. <coughs> Employee goes and does mis-selling of products, that is a fraud. So, okay, somebody may embezzle some funds, it's a fraud. Do I report everything big, small to the central government? I all through the year I will be reporting. Then they introduced materiality. When it went to law ministry, law ministry threw it out. They said you can't define materiality. So back to square one. Now there is no definition. No this thing of materiality. You are saying offense involving fraud. Now we are back to the whole thing. And there is punishment if you contravene. This applies to statutory auditor, it applies to cost auditor, it applies to secretary auditor. And the punishment may be fine, not less than 1 lakh, but makes it to 25 lakhs of dollars. Then there is a format which has been prescribed. Finally, they agreed on one thing, that we will have to first report to company. Company has to give a reply within 45 days. Then within 60 days, we have to report to government. We have really to see how this will happen. So, imagine if you are come across all entries, you come across, you know, companies making claims and taxation which could be inappropriate. There are a whole host of things when you look at the definition of fraud, it's very wide. And that is really the problem. They prescribe this form. It's very easy to devise a form. And in talks of estimated amount involved in suspected fraud, whether auditor is satisfied with the details of steps taken by company, they come to the truth. Why should an auditor be asked to do this? So this is a huge issue. 143 is a big issue. We will have to wait for guidance. It's true that the government has to come on to guidance because it impacts anyone. Tomorrow something goes wrong. The auditor will be asked, you did not do this. There is a reporting obligation to settle government action. You did not. Okay, so it could change the focus of auditor. I spoke about internal financial controls. The internal financial controls you will see here. Uh, 
there is the auditing standard, so let's not uh, spend time on that. Law requires you to comply with all auditing standards. NFRA will do the inspection, so that is one. Now let's do scope of service, section 144. What does it say? It says an auditor shall not provide the following services to any holding subsidiary associate directly or indirectly. Accounting and bookkeeping, internal audit, design, implementation, actuarial, fine. Broadly, the concept is uh, your independence is impaired if you are put in a position where you have to review your own work or rely upon your own. That is the broad principle. You can't do internal audit and then do statutory audit at the same time. You can't write the books and do the audit. Huh? Accept that. What they did was, so all of this are the in that plan. They added this called management services. If you see the Irani committee report and go back to the genesis of the company exam, there they said management functions. That means if some function is outsourced to you or you are making decisions on behalf of management, then your independence is impaired, you cannot be an auditor. Now the great news, because everywhere else the word services are there, the law ministry changed it to management. Now lawyers are interpreting management services, management consultancy services, or any advisory service, including tax service. They say they say uh, you are taking this, you are filing tax returns, you are doing, uh, fighting an appeal, so you are doing a management function. Management should file the tax return. Management, should, uh, which is in my view rubbish. Internationally, that is not so. nowhere. But the way they have worded this is causing a lot of problem. And what they have further said is, you cannot do it directly or indirectly. Meaning yourself, any firm you are associated with, you cannot or do the true parent subsidiary associate, anybody rendering service in any way. So it is a very, very wide. What about due diligence? <coughs> Pardon? Due diligence report to the bank? No, due diligence theoretically you can do. In my view, you can do. The killer is this. Or otherwise nobody can do that. That's the point I am making. Management services in my view should be management functions. Once you do that, you see, if you are doing actual services, as an auditor you rely on the actual evaluation. If you are doing investment advisory services, you are actually doing a management function. You are doing business in investment. Right? Investment advisory services theoretically can include due diligence, but the due diligence is not investment advisory services in my view. Though it comes under that whole context of acquiring a company is also investment advisory. When you are doing a due diligence, you are not advising them to buy or sell. You are saying, I have found this, you take your own decision. You are not making any, you are doing a due diligence, what is due diligence? You are giving a view on a certain work which is done by you or examination by no, I am talking about due diligence submitted to the bank for warrant every year. Correct. Even a due diligence to the what is the fundamentally what you do in a due diligence in that case, tell me. What do you do? Do you do a management function? No, there is a format given by RBI. There are right. three points. Hmm. So you are certifying yes no statement, you are certifying their payments, you see insurance of the property, so many things you are. So you are, you are reporting on statements of fact. Or, correct. You are not taking any decisions on behalf of the money. It's a part of your audit statutory. Correct. So therefore, all I am trying to say is it is not covered by any of this. Therefore, it is permitted to be done for a client. I am also covering due diligence in the context of acquisitions. Companies acquiring, making, planning to acquire another entity. You are a great auditor. Company knows how well you do an audit. So they say, why don't you do a due diligence? So you go and examine the books of that company, you are there. On the basis of which they may decide to buy or not buy that company. Now that is, in my view, not a conflict in any of this. That's it. And that is it. again similar to this. Here you are doing it on behalf of the other bank. It's reliable. You could do a due diligence even on behalf of the bank. But the scope of services coupled with rotation, coupled with relative, is a huge challenge. I am telling you so far as the profession is concerned. Because 
and particularly some argue that this includes tax services then it's disastrous. It is not right. And legal fraternity gets into technicalities of the wording and then becomes into problems. But they need to come out with it because even the Institute of Chartered Accountants has very clearly said what you can and cannot do for your for your client if you of which you are the auditor. It should also say you can't do accounting services and be standard work. Then what about corporate governance again? Corporate is an attest function. Absolutely no independence. Absolutely you should. Corporate governance, you have got equivalent to SAS 70, which is for software companies you have. Corporate governance, no problem. No. Where is your independence impact? Are you relying on your own work? No. Are you in a put in a position where you have to uh, uh, review your own work on no. either case. You are reporting on compliance with a certain government's requirement. You are not taking any decisions. Yes. Pardon? I have no doubt. For that matter, there are many areas, whether it is uh, taxation, whether it is even consulting in many areas, management may not have all the expertise as you rightly do. Merely because an audit firm has that expertise and does it, it doesn't impair independence. Currently, the institute's rules also used to say, beyond audit fees, you should not do any services in terms of monetary level. But here, the way they have gone about and written the law, there is no monetary law. They say you can't do all these. Many of these are the right.